Greetings and welcome to the United States Transhumanist Party Virtual Enlightenment Salon. My name is Janati Stoliroff II, and I am the chairman of the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Here we hold conversations with some of the world's leading thinkers in longevity, science, technology, philosophy, and politics. Like the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment, we aim to connect every field of human endeavor and arrive at new insights to achieve longer lives, greater rationality, and the progress of our civilization. Greetings and welcome to our virtual Enlightenment Salon of April 10th, 2022. We are pleased to have a fascinating and unique conversation in store for you on cat longevity. Joining us is a distinguished panel of U.S. Transhumanist Party officers and members, including our Director of Visual Art, Art Ramon Garcia, our Legislative Director, Jason Geringer, our Director of Longevity Outreach, Ben Balweg, and our Technology Advisor and Foreign Ambassador in Spain, Dr. Jose Cordero. And our special guest today is Alexandru Ioan Voda, who is a final year Doctor of Philosophy student at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom, though today he joins us from Romania. He is a transhumanist, a longevity advocate who has worked on longevity science for a decade and a half, and he is a published researcher. Today, he will speak to us about a project that he currently is engaged in regarding cat longevity diagnostics. So welcome, Alexandru. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. What aspects of cat longevity are you studying and what can you tell us about this fascinating subject? Thank you for having me first. And um, this is really a pleasure to talk to all of you. Um, um, I think the, there, there are many reasons why cat longevity is, is an interesting topic to, um, to look into and why diagnostics are a subtopic of that that are um, a nice pick. Um, so f firstly, th th there are many reasons why you could go into um, pet longevity projects. Um, one of them is that you care about your pets um, obviously I have a cat. Um, I, um, I wish that they'd have a longer lifespan, not just myself. Um, but there's also a lot of other reasons, right? Um, so if you look at, uh, most of the startups that are going into longevity, if they're choosing, um, the vet space and are, um, um, sort of asked to justify about it to investors, one of the reasons the uh, the investors may hear is regulatory burden. So one of the things that's pretty difficult with human trials is getting through the approvals by FDA to uh, run the initial trials, um, ongoing regulatory filings, even after the drug is approved and, and so on and so forth. Whereas the veterinary landscape is a lot lighter. And you know there, there may be uh, pros and cons to that. So obviously one, cons to that is that because it's less regulated, it's a bit more risky, um, meaning when you enroll your pet in, in a trial, um, you, you, you can be slightly less confident about um, how much work has been put in, into assuring that um, that drug is safe and, um, and sound for the prescription that it's being trialed for, um, but also it has a lot of cons which is a lot of pros, which is um, having less regulation means that you can um, quicken the innovation rate. And because the burden that you have restricts not only the budget of the company, restricts also, you know, a, a, a bunch of um, the iterative things that you, you need um, in terms of uh, trial drugs out. So um, with all of that boring stuff out of the way, um, in terms of, you know, like uh, why why you'd pick cats, there's also some funny reasons why uh, you'd pick cats in terms of um, longevity research. It's because they're longer lived. Um, they chase lasers. Um, and 
Um, also, there's very few companies pursuing anything related to um, non-dog stuff. Um, so if you look at the longevity vet space, you will see Rejuvenate Bio by George Church and um, and people from his lab. Um, you will see uh, Selena Halioa's um, uh, Cellular Longevity Incorporated company. I think it's loyal for dogs. Um, and all of these companies have huge funding, and it's really um, really great to see that. But at the same time, it sort of um, begs the question of um, why we're avoiding half the um, pet healthcare market. Um, and that's the sort of gap that we're trying to fill. And the interesting thing about diagnostics is um, there are all of these aging clock methods out there, uh, which I'm sure some of you might might be familiar with. And I, I hope you're not annoyed at me for um, patronizing some introduction and discussion on it. But um, essentially aging clocks are a combination of um, markers, um, levels of proteins or or RNAs or DNA methylation and metabolites, anything that can tell you something about the status of the healthcare in some organism. Um, and they're, um, they're widely used and accelerating in use as well, mainly because of several reasons, um, including the, uh, the fact that um, uh, survival trials are very expensive. So following up um, treated versus non-treated um, groups takes a lot of years and takes a lot of funding, whereas it's slightly easier to look at biomarkers that are um, uh, correlated to something that you're interested in, like longevity or health span or um, uh, the status in the disease that's um, heavily linked to mortality, like um, heart failure and so on. Um, so the interesting thing about um, clocks is there's a huge fight at all times on all topics related to clocks. For example, whether they should be used in trials or not. If you if you just browse Twitter for a while, you will see at least three fights um, every every afternoon between very um, high people in the fields. And um, I think that's good. That means that there's a lot of innovation go, um, going on. That means there's a lot of um, back and forth on how to do certain things. And maybe there are multiple ways that you could do certain things. And we certainly think that we can do um, better clocks um, in terms of chronological aging est um, estimation and um, in terms of mortality estimation and so on and so forth um, in cats. So um, as a first plugin, um, I, I co-founded um, a company called the Cat Health Data Science uh, Corporation. It's uh, currently incorporated in Delaware um, with Alexander Bochita, my, um, my awesome co-founder. Um, and we've got a few other people joining us um, very soon, and we're looking out for investors. Um, we are currently in talks with VidaDAO um, and, um, uh, and a bunch of other um, investor panels. Um, and yeah, I think, um, I think that's a pretty long um, introduction to it. But uh, for the moment, I think that's, that's it. And what I can tell you about um, the cat longevity diagnostics. Oh, um, some other additional thing is um, our venture is supposed to be split in two. So we're going to have various projects that we're going to uh, pursue in an open source, um, collaborative, free, free access way, patentless and um, usable by um, any, um, any people on the internet that can follow the specs of the um, algos and um, laboratory protocols that we're developing. And then there's also going to be a commercial side. So on the non-commercial side, we just got funded uh, through Gitcoin by um, a lot of um, generous, uh, generous um, donors of crypto um, for about 10K worth of, um, $10,000 worth of 
um, sequencing and 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 other uh, sort of um, costs for for a trial to improve um, aging clocks in cats. Um, and obviously, depending on what a panel thinks about this, we can dive into details on um, on the specifics of the clocks or on the company on the commercial side, on um, longevity in general and politics and um, yeah. Excellent. Well, th thank you, uh, Alexandru, for those introductory remarks. And I've linked here to the page on Gitcoin, where essentially you have a description of your project. Would you say this is the most comprehensive source for people to visit if they want to learn more? Or is there another page somewhere where you have even more details or an overview of your plans that you would be able to share? Um, this is definitely the most um, in-depth resource for the open, um, open source uh, projects of the company. We are gonna um, we are gonna increase the detail in there as as we go, um, and it's, we're gonna update that link as we're gonna participate in further rounds of Gitcoin. Um, but in terms of the commercial side, the only help I can provide is um, telling you that we're doing more than the open source projects. Um, so um, most of the slides that we have are investor oriented and have proprietary stuff on them. But I guess I can I can give you a very short summary on that, maybe like thirty seconds of it. Um, so essentially, on the commercial side, we're interested in um, further developing the clocks, but also um, looking into um, therapies, so things that can modify the clocks um, and can modify the mortality, and and also have a few other measurements outside of the clocks in terms of whether they work or not for particular um, prescriptions. So, for example, one uh, prescription that happens in a lot of cats is sarcopenia, 38% roughly um, by the latest research um, is, the, is the rate at which elderly cats suffer of sarcopenia. Um, mild or severe sarcopenia, so keep in mind, it's not all of the old cats have um, severe sarcopenia, as in they can't move around, but they have mild muscle loss, which can be um, we hope mitigated by um, cer certain therapeutic approaches. And the sort of main therapeutic approach we want to go on the commercial side, and this is a differentiator between us and other um, longevity companies in the pet, um, uh, pet healthcare area, is that we're not seeking to find new aging drugs. So obviously there's a lot of small molecules out there that modify um, lifespan and health span from rapamycin to metformin and so on and so forth. Um, the, the, the question we're trying to answer on the commercial side of the startup is whether um, specific combinations of uh, known off-patent drugs um, act in synergy. So if they have a positive interaction, say you have a drug that has um, that improves lifespan by 3% and a drug that improves lifespan by 5%, the question here is, whether together they improve lifespan, not by 5%, not by 3%, but whether they improve the lifespan by 20% together just because they have a positive interaction. So we were trying to find whether there's any high effect size, um, so anything between 30, 50, 70% improvement in, in various healthcare um, measurements in, in elderly cats. And we want to do that mainly because um, cocktails of unpatented drugs are patentable. Um, and that way we can also get some revenue to sort of fund the other open source um, projects that we want to pursue. And on the open source side, what will your focus be? What do you anticipate publishing and how can people collaborate with you on that side if they wish? So, on, on, on that side, I think the, the most use, um, firstly, if anyone has any idea uh, on helping us, uh, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email is um, alexandru.voda at thecathealth.com. The, the so I'm just going to type that in the private, in, in, in the comments soon. Um, 
And um, in terms of specific help that we could use, um, obviously, outside of funding, which we will never reject, um, is um, expertise or access to um, Oxford um, nanopore technology. Um, so one, one thing that we want to use more um, in the future is um, long read uh, sequencing technology, which is not currently used by uh, most of the um, clocks on the market. For example, the Steve Horvath clock is based, well, what, most of them are based on um, arrays, um, which is kind of like a plate with tiny um, pieces of um, DNA or RNA or so, uh, so on and so forth attached to them um, and imaging on that. We want to use sequencing because we can find new molecules so we don't have to fix them on a plate and, and, and decide beforehand what's, um, what's important or not. Um, and there's a couple of advantages in that technology that we want to exploit that other people haven't. Um, but obviously, um, we're not um, experts on all of the aspects of uh, nanopore um, uh, technology. So anybody that's um, specialized in there um, can, can, can is welcome to email me, of course. Um, also, um, we're very interested in collaborating with as many veterinary doctors as possible. So right now we're in talks with about 20 veterinary doctors across the UK and Romania. Um, and we're looking to expand in the US and we actually haven't talked to any uh, veterinarians in the US as of yet. Um, and th the reason why that's useful is because obviously the blood um, collection and all of these uh, initial procedures are done by veterinary uh, doctors in cabinets and we need collaborators on that side. Um, and also it's nice to have a clinical input in the sort of uh, drug lists that we're currently filtering down um, to um, having run with the ran with the trials later on. Um, so yeah, any any help in that or any help in anything else, if you have an idea of how we can get more funding or if you have an idea related to how we can um, reach um, um, European funds, um, I, I mean, public, um, research council uh, funds and any of that, we're very open to um, um, to collaborators on that. So, yeah. Yes, thank you very much, Alexandru. And if anybody listening to this salon would like to engage in those kinds of collaborations, I have posted Alexandru's email here. And now for a bit more of a lighthearted interlude. Here's a joke from Mike Lazine. Why are cats cooler than dogs? Answer, you never hear anyone saying that a person is a cool dog. No, <laughs> they say cool cat. So I am biased. I am a cat owner myself. I have two cats who are approaching the age of 12 and I clearly want to maximize their longevity. And if I had two dogs approaching the age of 12, they would be in trouble already because one of the advantages that cats have over dogs is that they do live a bit longer. So I'm curious, as a scientist, how would you characterize the differences in longevity between cats and dogs? Now, intuitively, average lifespans for cats are longer. How much longer? And what is the variation in cat lifespans as compared to the variation in dog lifespans that has been observed? So um, I, it's very hard to characterize that, mainly because both in dogs and in cats, there's a lot of variation between breeds of cats. That's, a, that's the first, first thing that comes to mind. Um, I mean, even in dogs, if you look at pugs versus um, Great Danes, they have very different um, diseases that they're being afflicted of. Um, most dogs have um, heart failure as, as a mortality cause, whereas pugs specifically have more leaning into respiratory diseases. And so you can, you can see, depending on how evolution shaped um, um, their bodies and metabolisms, you get very different, um, very different outcomes, average outcomes. 
Um, in cats, one, in one interesting fact to it is that um, actually a lot of cats die in um, in car accidents and and trauma uh, traumatic events like falling from a tree or stuff like that. Um, you you might have heard you know and and seen with your own eyes that cats always land on four paws, um, but um, actually the, 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 they they expose themselves to way more mechanical risk than than dogs tend to do. Um, so that's 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 a very tragic thing and it happens to a lot of people. Um, a friend of mine just lost um, his cat about um, several days ago. Um, so also they fit more places than dogs, which is again another reason why they have uh, mechanical um, mechanical risk on um, on lifespan. But um, overall, um, I think the major causes of uh, disease, as far as um, medical statistics journal, uh, veterinary statistics journals go, are CKD, um, chronic kidney disease, is a very big thing in cats, and it happens a lot with age. And then all of the other things that you see in humans and in dogs as well, so like heart failure, cancer, um, and, and a bunch more like neurodegenerative diseases and so on and so forth. Um, I think... The, 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 there are big um, factors in lifespan, including, you know, like how wealthy the owner is. Um, that makes a very big difference in the environment that the cat is um, uh, brought in. in um, it makes a whole difference in, in their diet and, and lifestyle and activity and access to um, veterinary care. Um, obviously, that's one of the issues that the startups uh, is trying to estimate when we're trying to um, reach investors and sort of give them a realistic scenario about what the potential um, revenues could be is how much people can spend on their cats. Because obviously most people prioritize their own healthcare over their cats. Healthcare is not um, super affordable, even if you live in, um, you know, in a, in a state healthcare uh, sort of area. Um and um, I think the average spending on healthcare in, in, in cats is about uh, $200 a year in the United States or, or something less, 150 something around that area. Um, whereas in other countries, it's significantly less. It, it gets closer to $50. So that makes a huge difference in, in how best you can treat uh, fractures that they suffered during trauma, uh, which a lot of cats go through, I think, um, probably like 20% of the cats or 15% of the cats um, suffer of um, mechanical trauma, like injuries, uh, strained muscles, um, broken, uh, broken ribs, broken um, fractured um, legs, and so on. Um, I think it'd be best to cite a paper on this. Um, I have a favorite one, which I uh, keep citing. It has a really nice table. So I'm uh, going to mute myself just for a minute to seek it, and then I'm going to post it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, thank you. And while Alexandru uh, searches, I will point out a few resources that we have shared. First of all, the oldest cat uh, ever recorded, and there's a Wikipedia entry on her, is Cream Puff. Cream Puff lived to 38 years and three days. She lived from August 3rd, 1967 to August 6th, 2005. Now, this is remarkable in that this is a much longer lifespan than most cats reach. Generally, when cats die and we learn about it, they're in their late teens or early 20s, at least anecdotally. But this cream puff was able to live to essentially twice as long as many cats. <laughs> and the question that I have is, is this a plausible lifespan for cats to reach if they receive the same kind of medical care that humans get? If a human becomes ill and suffers some sort of chronic condition too that might be expensive to maintain. Generally, 
there's no argument, at least in the Western world, that money should be spent on this, whether it's a private system or a governmental system. So if cats had a similar standard of care, do you think many of them would live into their 30s? I think um, most not. So most most of the cats, even with very good um, care, would not. It's it's still determined by a bunch of very stochastic, very random processes. Um, it, de it also depends on an individual's genetics, right? Like even in humans, um, where uh, people have this uh, programmed aging versus non-programmed aging fight at all times on Twitter and and in papers and everywhere. Um, it's 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 easy to forget that things are sometimes in the middle. Um, so, for example, human longevity is somewhat heritable, um, and it's kind of the same for cats as well. Like even in 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 cats, you don't expect um, that all of the genotypes um, will will live extreme lifespans, even if they have all of the favorable environment um, possible without new interventions. Obviously, if you, if you take enzyme, uh, enzyme replacement therapy and, um, and uh, gene therapy and, and, um, and uh, new small molecule drugs and uh, localized delivery of um, specific therapies and, and improve, significant improvements in the technology of current medicine, um, I'd say yes. But without significant um, improvements, I, I wouldn't say that the mean lifespan would change a lot. Um, and it's 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 easy to forget that human lifespan didn't mean human lifespan didn't significantly extend without radical changes in medical technology, from vaccination to hygiene to um, improvements in in cancer care um, and and and. Um, therapeutics in general on drugs. So I would say no. Also, I would say that um, it's, it's, it's very hard to take these one-off cases. So it's very hard to say um, it, this is uh, the oldest recorded cat, and I'm sure that she is. I'd like, I'd, I lived with her in my, in my house for like 38 years. I can't say for certain that that happened um, because I didn't live in the house. I don't have any um, indication about um, uh, the sort of um, rumors about Marie Jean Calman. If you remember, there's a lot of fights about whether um, she actually lived that long, whether it was inheritance fraud that her daughter committed, that sort of stuff. And so I'm, I'm trying to avoid it, even though, like, all of you, I, I care mostly about maximal lifespan because I think that as long as I put all my resources in um, lifespan, um, medical, um, lifespan enhancing medical technology, that I can fare better than the average um, lifespan provided in general. But um, obviously the, the goal would be to extend um, medical technologies to where you don't care about one example, to where you don't have to look at Marie Jean Command or the longest lived cat or the longest lived dog, where you can just say, oh, by pure chance, I think as long as I have these um, therapies on hand, I, I can think about myself living way longer than just 70, 80, 90 years old. Um, and it, it, it's really hard. There's a really nice paper. I'm gonna. Um, I'm. I'm sorry. Did you. Um, did you manage to post the one I put in the yes. private? Yes. So it's I'm currently gonna... being shown here. Uh, so that's the paper by Dan O'Neill and others from 2015. Awesome. So that's that's like a completion of what we talked before as well, where it uh, shows that uh, trauma is like the leading cause of mortality in this sample of um, several thousand cats, um, actually, sorry, like 118,000 cats. Uh, and then it's followed by CKD, renal disorders and other things like that. And then cancer, heart disease, etc. Uh, so that's a really nice paper. Another pa uh, paper I'd mention is one I'm going to put in the private chat very soon. I think most of the longevists know about it. It's a paper where they've shown that, um, uh, villages where, there's evidence of extraordinary longevity in humans. 
um, tend to, not all of them, but some tend to be correlated with um, increases in, um, in inheritance tax fraud, <laughs> which is an unfortunate thing to, um, to have. And so th the question is um, whether we should trust extreme longevity or median longevity. And obviously I want extreme longevity um, to be something that we can touch, something that we can uh, experience in our lives. Uh, but um, it's probably best to improve the median one with um, improved technology, improved drugs, improved therapies, and so on. Um, and then think about the, um, the extreme longevity in, in just individuals as opposed to um, groups. Um, maybe there will be some libertarian yelling at me. Just you know I'm on the same boat, but I'm just, yeah, I'm just, um, um, yeah, I'm just um, spitting some two cents on that. Yes, well, thank you for sharing your thoughts on this. Now, I will note with regard to extreme human longevity, now Kane Tanaka in Japan has reached the status of the second oldest human ever, the second oldest verified human. She is 119 years and 98 days old, and she just became the second oldest human ever today, the third oldest human was Sarah Knaus, uh, who died on December 30th, 1999. She was 119 years and 97 days. So even if Jean Calmont's uh, history might not be authentic, and I don't know if it is or isn't, we have someone who is likely, uh, perhaps, to get to 120. So there is this outer limit right now, given the capabilities of medical technology that is around 120 years for humans. And I do think it would be an immense victory for our movement if that limit could be reliably breached, even by several people, if more individuals are verified to exceed Jean Calment's record, that will raise attention to the promises of longevity science and convince people that death by a certain age is not inevitable. So I do think there's value in seeking to extend maximum lifespans. But what I'm curious about is in terms of the comparison to cats. So cream puff uh, died at 38. Is 38 then the analog of the human 120? in the sense that the reason why most cats die much earlier than that is the reason why, say, in the Middle Ages, most humans died much earlier than the 70s or the 80s that they reliably reach today? Or is cream puffs age uh, more similar to the human 200, where cats are capable of being much more extreme longevity outliers uh, as contrasted with humans, where if humans do get good health care, good sanitation, according to the current standards, if they are able to avoid wars, pandemics, etc., then even these days, without too much effort in terms of lifestyle, most people can live reliably into their 70s. So uh, with regard to cats, are they in the equivalent of the human Middle Ages or are they in the equivalent of the human 20th century in terms of their uh, baseline conditions that allow them to uh, live to a certain age fairly reliably? Uh, we hope that they're um, in, um, in the Middle Ages right now. Um, and not in the sense that we hope they stay there, but in the... In, in, in the sense that we think that because there's lower regulatory burden and um, because um, there's more opportunities to innovate um, in that space, we, th we think that they might be um, on the verge of um, on the verge of significant life extension um, of the kind that we we've, we've seen. Um, in centuries ago in humans. Um, I think humans will follow as well, but 
you have to think about um, how people allocate risk. And most of the people don't want to um, allocate risk on themselves, um, it, except, you know, a very um, famous examples like Elizabeth Parrish, um, like a uh, Nobel winning, um, uh, Nobel Prize winning um, gastroenterologist who proved, um, I think, um, a type of bacteria that could grow, there was a, a type of bacteria that could grow in um, gastric juice. Um, it, and there's a bunch of other people that are an exception to that rule, but nonetheless, that's a rule. And I think that's a rule for anybody who isn't a biohacker. Um, and most of the people aren't biohackers. Um, and so I think, I think there's a lot more um, innovation to be had in a very short time span um, in cats in right now. Otherwise, I do my best to try and do, do stuff in humans. Although I know um, there's a lot of um, human work that's um, that's amazing right now. So there's a lot of um, work in a, a bunch of um, therapeutic categories from uh, blood factors. Um, you know, a lot of people looking at individual markers that they can um, upregulate in blood um, to people that in um, in, in in into cell therapies, into gene therapies, into um, a bunch of these um, things that um, that they're slowly carrying in humans um, over, um, I, I guess over um, over decades since books have been written, you know, from End Engaging to a bunch of other um, very famous books, um, you will see that innovation in humans has been kind of slow, and a part of the reason for that is that risk allocation is very different. In, in humans, we, we tend to um, we tend to take way less of a risk with people with um, our own kind and and with um, essentially people that live that, that can live very long, right? Whereas with cats, when you get a sixteen year old cat that has sarcopenia and CKD, um, the worst case scenario is she dies a few uh, months earlier, um, and so risk allocation in people's minds is very different. And I think that's going to be a driver for why dogs and cats are going to have a lot of um, medical innovation. And the really interesting thing there um, is, um, you, you know, that saying that if you're a mouse, we have very good news for you. In <laughs> um, one of the reasons why a lot of mouse uh, research is failing is because the, the, the sample sizes for experiments are very um, small and the mice are very uniform and they live in kind of like the same conditions. That's for good reasons because you want to have reproducibility. You want to see in the same conditions, the same genotype, you get the same effect. But the question in for, for drugs in humans and a lot of more complex animals is how can you find drugs that have effect, large effects, no matter the environmental conditions or no matter the genotype. And I think you're going to see that a lot in cats and dogs, mainly because um, the, the risk allocation is much higher, um, and because um, uh, because the treatments are ultimately carried in non-uniform animals or um, coming from a wide variety of backgrounds, and so you're going to only see um, and only focus on the effects that actually are reproducible, no matter the conditions. Um, yeah. Um, and also yes. I'm going to post this paper on inheritance fraud versus, uh, extreme longevity. Um, yes. Yeah. And I will share that link shortly. I'm curious if you think that it would be feasible along the lines that you are studying to develop treatments that could be disseminated at least to a significant portion of cat owners such that, say, by 2030, a lot of house cats could live to age 25, for instance, fairly reliably. So obviously, we want to scale up as fast as possible. I don't think we can make promises as to how long the cats will live. Because obviously, some therapies work better for some things, right? Like if, if you're going to develop some, um, uh, some novel methods of treating CKD, 
uh, age-related um, um, chronic kidney disorders, um, then that's obviously not going to extend the lifespans of cats that don't have that type of disease. And that, I, I think that's the ticking um, bomb with um, aging, which is like a lot of people are trying to say, oh, I'm just going to extend lifespan with this drug, or I'm going to do that um, with that therapy. And really, I think even when you look at very general treatments like um, rapamycin and metformin and so on, really you're targeting an ageotype. I can't remember what paper it was that uh, coined this term, but it's a really nice term that I think more people should use. Ageotype means a subtype of aging um, in terms of what diseases you get, what sort of um, metabolism wreckings are going around, or what sort of if you're a programmed aging sort of believer, um, which you may or may not be, I don't, I, I, I don't know um, it, 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 what sort of sub part of the clock is um, getting um, getting its uh, wind back. So, I, th I think um, we can't promise, you know, uh, cats are going to live 30 or more by 2030, and I, I don't want to do that sort of Aubrey de Grey prediction. Uh, because it's really hard to hold without data. And one of the things that I care a lot about is showing people some work related to longevity that they can reproduce and that, that they can try on their own 100 cat sample size trial and they're going to get the same result. And I don't think I can right now say that there's any therapy that's going to take for sure cats to 30 years old. Or so, but if we see anything that extends lifespan even by uh, 40 or 30 percent, then we are going to pursue that. And obviously, anything that's lower than that, we're not interested um, because it's really widely available in terms of um, in terms of general, like more, more uh, multi ageotype therapies, kind of like um, um, kind of like aging retardants. Um, but I, I would certainly hope that we can extend the lifespan of cats by a lot. And if we see, like if, if we have reliable data in our trials of combinations of um, known aging modulators to see if they have positive interactions, you know, where you have a 3% effect, 5% effect, not being equal to 8% or just 5% or something like that, but equal to, 30% or more, I would certainly hope that at least some of the cats from thousands of cats being treated with that um, therapy from there on, I would certainly hope that some of them will live very extreme lifespans. I would hope that they reach 40 um, and, and, you know, like um, have an amazing never before seen thing. But the thing about that is you cannot predict it. You just have to work on it. Um, and, um, kind of like how, um, if you asked, um, professor Cynthia Kenyon, uh, whether she would have found, um, uh, two mutations in DAF2 and DAF16 or whatever other genes back then that would double the lifespan of C. elegans, then before that finding, she'd be like, I, I don't know, <laughs> I really don't want to promise anything. Or maybe she would be all like, um, I, I don't think that that's possible, um, but uh, it's, it's it's the the thing that we can say is that there are uh, reproducible life extensions by um, specific small molecule drugs, specific um, enzyme replacement therapies, and so on and so forth. And then the optimistic scenario is combinations of those in various doses are going to um, increase lifespan by a lot. The medium scenario is like they're going to extend lifespan by some amount. And then like the worst case scenario is actually they work on the same thing at all times and that there's no um, lifespan extension. In which case, um, everyone who's been all like, oh, I told you cryonics was the lead or, um, you know, mind mapping and um, and um, transcendence is is really the uh, really the goal for longevity would be very happy about this, but I'd be very sad about it because that'd be my favorite scenario where you can essentially extend lifespan by a lot. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, that that's about it.
Yes, and absolutely, that would be my favorite scenario as well. I would rather not have this biological existence be interrupted because I do have various concerns, as I've expressed in prior virtual enlightenment salons, about whether one's iness, that which makes one the same individual, would be perpetuated with these other techniques, whereas with biological life extension, it clearly would be. Now, uh, I did post the link to the paper that you mentioned by Saul Justin Newman entitled, Supercentenarians and the Oldest Old are Concentrated into Regions with No Birth Certificates and Short Lifespans. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on this, Alexandru, before we move on to the rest of the panel. And that is, with regard to common claims made about the blue zones, uh, for instance, that people there get plenty of fresh air and outdoor activity, and they have robust social networks, and they have good dietary habits. Do you think that's a significant contributor to the observed longevity in those areas to the extent that it is observed? Or do you think a lot of the observed longevity could be explained more by these kinds of statistical artifacts or correlations with other activity we don't necessarily want to see, like uh, the uh, potential to forge a birth certificate? I think it's a mix. I think there's both inheritance fraud and um, and certain things about certain villages and certain areas, diets, lifespan, lifestyles, and so on, that modify lifespan by a lot. Um, the hard thing there is to distinguish how much in between them. Because it's clear that it's both of them. You can have a model that um, has one at 30% and the other is 70%, and then another model is completely different. Um, and, and I'm not... While I'm very interested in statistics and I study statistics at um, at my um, PhD a lot in in terms of um, in terms of um, figuring out how to weigh things um, mathematically, I'm not a specialist in that area. The only thing I know from people that work in the field is that there is controversy around how much each of them weigh, and I don't think anyone says. Um, there's, or maybe if they do, they're very silly about this, um, th that there's no, um, benefit in specific age, uh, specific, um, areas of Japan, for example, Japan has a lot of, um, um, villages that have extreme longevity, um, uh, groups. Um, and I think, uh, also Ashkenazi Jews, um, have a specific um, specific villages uh, populated mainly with Ashkenazi Jews have extreme longevity as well. Um, there's a bunch of other groups that are very interesting to study. But um, th th there's one challenge that a lot of uh, statisticians will uh, tell you about, which is um, observational studies have issues with causality tracing. So you don't know whether specific factors are causal to that or whether when you have a genotype or an environment that makes you live longer, then you also do some other environmental thing. So you don't know, for example, um, a very nice example is Marie, let's say Marie Jean Colmant lived very long. I don't want to fight the people that say that she didn't. I don't want to fight the people that say that she did. <laughs> Whichever way it goes, um, let's assume that she lived uh, 127 or something like that. Um, then some people might go and say go on and say well she smoked a lot and ate a lot of chocolate so just throw the diabetes and and the lung disease sort of issues away they're not an impediment to longevity and really the answer there is okay so you look at an observational thing where maybe you had this observation of the data you cannot assert causality you cannot know that there are other things that affected the outcome or that the direction of the effect is right that's why you want to have interventional studies. And again, it's it's hard to have interventional studies in humans. It's not hard to have interventional studies in, in vets, um, mainly because of the politics and the way people uh, structure their lives and their governments and their regulations and so on. 
Um, and um, so in terms of um, in, in terms of saying stuff like uh, there's there's things in these villages that prolong their lifespans, I'm certainly interested in hearing about the data, but I'm also very wary about focusing only on that as opposed to doing the most important thing, which is interventional trials. Um, and and I think you know if, if, if there's a piece of advice um, in there, take more uh, more natural teas, uh, do more exercise, go to church, uh, hang around with people, have a community around that that sort of stuff. If that's some advice that comes out of the paper, fine. But if if we're starting to say oh, that that's really the only meaningful thing that we can do about longevity or that's the thing that we should focus on, or we should fund X more studies on these observational uh, village village studies, then my personal answer would be, maybe you should stop doing that because there's much more value taking um, comparisons of randomized um, interventional um, double-blind um, stratified um, designs where you're asking um, villagers for a long time to do whatever treatment. You know, maybe you look at survival, or maybe you look at aging clocks, maybe you look at some biomarkers, maybe you do something else, but it, anything you do there is easier to assess in terms of causality than um, these, sort of, um, these sort of observational cohort studies. Um, so I think they're nice, but um, for some people, their value is overstated. And obviously, there are some people for which their value is understated. They say, oh, these are worthless. And I don't think that they're worthless. Um, but it's just about the focus. So I can remember my mom talking a lot about these. Um, oh, uh, people eat this specific berry. And I was like, oh, come on. Like, maybe. That, maybe. But there's no, like, the study doesn't say that for sure this is what happened. This is an observational study. You have to give that berry to a randomized group and placebo to a whatever other group. And then you can say, you know, this is the true effect. This is the direction and it's et cetera and et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that's, my, that's my final thought on, on, on uh, extreme longevity in villages and studies of that. Yes, thank you. And our friend Didier Cornell points out in the chat that Jean Calmont lived to 122 years. I've linked here to the Wikipedia page. Her lifespan was 122 years, 164 days. So what's fascinating is that Kane Tanaka, if she lives for another three and a half years, would be able to exceed that lifespan. So we shall have to wait and hope and if she does exceed that lifespan, then perhaps Jean Calmont's story will look more plausible to the skeptics as well. But now let us go to Jason Geringer. Uh, Jason, I know you have a number of questions, so please feel free to proceed with whichever one you think is most fitting. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the kind of cats... Uh, do you? I heard that there's a breed that, and like that's the most common breed, maybe even is from like northern Egypt or northern Africa and stuff. Um, is that the kind of you use? Well, first of all, is that true that that's like the most common breed is, is there, and and is that the kind you use, or does it matter? Uh, yeah. I think i think it's, it depends also by country so different countries have different preferences in terms of breeds that they buy um there are countries actually that don't have any preference they just have a lot of stray cats i think that's the case for romania um and i, th I think I don't, I don't know do i remember right that the egyptian cats are the ones that have very little fur right like they're very wrinkly and and um, no, the, the sphinx the Asian, cats, they're called. That's a, yeah, I think that's a different breed. The northern Egypt ones are, are, are not, they're like, I, they, um, uh, I think the, the ones that the wild ones now look a lot like the, that breed. And so, like, my cat looks a lot like that breed. They're the kind that got 
I don't know, the stripey stuff. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, yeah, I was wondering how the exactly the, the experiments go. I mean, uh, which cats you use? I mean, is there a way for somebody to get involved in, in an experiment with their own cat, even if it's the control group or something? Uh, I'm wondering how that open source stuff that you was talking about works. So right now for the open source trial, we're going to go very local um, and very small sample size because we need to do some um, power calculations and so on to figure out how many, how many more cats we're going to need with the technology that we're going to assess. Um, so we haven't received the funding yet to start the trial. We're going to receive it on the 15th of April, like all of the other longevity um, longevity uh, grants on Gitcoin. Um, just a, a little bit of self-plug right here. We, we were third place in the longevity category, which was really amazing. Um, and uh, once we receive that um, funding, we're going to go very local. We're going to assess probably around 20 to 40 cats um, around Bucharest and around um, Oxford in the UK. But as soon as the small scale trials are um, over, which I expect should be in about two or three months, at least the first phases of the project, then we're going to extend. Um, and, and we're still debating about how exactly to extend. So depending on how much funding we have and depending on how the team agrees to do the things, um, we're going to have um, trials where the consumers fund the trials. So all of the tests are paid by the consumers and then they receive all of the results that we get and we do analyses at the global scale where we have access to all of the data, whereas you only have access to your cat's data. The alternative is we forget enough funding, um, we um, we pay for uh, the trial, even, even for people in the States and, and so on and so forth. So if you want to come in the trial, you can email me. Um, and as long as we have enough funding by in, in about one or two months from now, um, when the first initial uh, testing phase is done, then we may may be able to fund um, the test for for your cat. Yeah, I think that that's a viable thing. I mean, I you know, if someone was to say, "Hey, uh, be part of this experiment. We'll give you these uh, the you know the drugs for your cat or whatever." Uh, you know, but then they would have to keep accurate data. I mean, how are you going to get just the general public to keep accurate data? Now, speaking of that, you were saying that the more the uh, you know the fact that the cats jump around and they're cats, they get hurt because they're you know they kill stuff, you know, and that that is a high percentage, you know. And I'm wondering, is that out of you was just mentioned uh, the cats around uh, Romania, um. Wouldn't if we're just talking house cats like my cat that never goes outside, wouldn't that be way different, you know? And wouldn't maybe we want the data to represent the, the cats that are probably going to be getting your funding in the eventually, which is probably you know, own, regular owners that you know keep their cats inside, you know, and in, in which case the data from trauma of stray cats wouldn't be valuable to that group you know what i mean um yeah, yeah. i know and i know what you mean so um uh, there's there's two questions there i mean let me unpack it a bit so in terms of um uh cats inside versus outside trauma the, the differences in sort of disease prevalence and trauma versus you know um, chronic kidney disorder and sarcopenia and whatever other things elderly cats suffer from um Obviously, we're going to focus on household cats because then we have a point of contact, which is the owner. Um, we did debate at some point trying to go for shelters, um, but unfortunately, a lot of shelters in Romania don't have very um, good treatment ethics for cats, and we don't want to get associated with that because we don't endorse it. Um, a lot of a lot of cats are mistreated in shelters, and and mainly because of poverty. Like there are many excuses if you want to make them. Um, but um, the the principal reason why we'd go for um, household cats is also what, what you said, which is differences in the sort of diseases that um, and in sort of physiology and health that 
the status that they have. Um, and so um, we only aim to work through vets. That's in terms of the administration of the drugs. Um, obviously, we're open to collaborate with vets across the world. Um, so if if you have a vet, veterinary doctor for your cat that you're uh, familiar with and, and you feel like you can communicate easily with them, um, we're going to have... Uh, a few employees soon, as long as as, as soon as we get funding, um, to sort of communicate with um, veterinary doctors or people that want to participate in the trial across the world. The second issue that we have there is shipping. So, so because the project is two ways. The first one is the open source trying to improve the diagnostic side, and then the second side is the uh, therapy trial side. Um, so, in, in in the therapy trial side. Um, it's going to be um, difficulties are regulatory approvals um, for uh, for those drugs in those states. Not all drugs are approved everywhere, if, even if they were FDA approved. So we have that one issue. Um, and on the diagnostic side, which is a separate, so just just to give you a timeline, the diagnostic side is going to happen in the next um, month to three months at most. And, um, and that's and it's gonna, part that outside open source can help with. And so the the open source isn't going to be on the diet or the okay I I get it what you mean what what does the diagnostic side entail I'm sorry to interrupt you go ahead so on the no no problem so on the diagnostic side the or the open source side is we're trying to improve markers of overall um, health in cats so obviously there's um, aging clocks there's a Horvath mammalian uh, clock it's pretty expensive it's more than a hundred dollars. Per sample, especially if you only send one sample, that's very expensive. Um, we tried to get uh, quotes for about 20 samples at a time, and they were still very expensive. So what we were trying to do is both bring the cost, uh, cost down while maintaining some accuracy on the um, blood clock, and then we we're trying to get a few other measurements, such as um, how deeply the cat sleeps, like REM versus non-REM, um, uh, the activity levels of the cat. So it turns out if you've Put a bracelet, uh, a collar on the on a on a cat. You can get a lot more measurements than um, than you know how heavy it is or the waistline or stuff like that. And the aim that we are we are putting out with the open source project is combining all of these different health measurements into one. Um, and most of the aging clocks really only take into account uh, at most some extra blood markers, like if you have high albumin or, or something like that. Um, and so we want to take into account um, not just the classical BMI, sex, et cetera, things. Um, we want to take into account activity levels, patterns of sleep, a bunch of other markers that we can do machine learning on and sort of develop um, develop better, more accurate clocks. Um, and good. then Those collars would be accurate. You wouldn't have to be depending on the owner to give you accurate information. You could give your exactly, yeah. exactly. And the blood clock is the same, um, is, as in we don't depend on on the uh, laboratory uh, prowess of of the owners. Um, but on the um, on the treatment side, which is going to be the commercial thing, obviously we still need our collaborators and help and so on. So you, you, you can email us. Um, if you want to participate in the trials. And as I said, depending on funding, we might be able to do a thing where we pay the therapies for the CADs. And that's probably the biggest aim for, for, the, for the diagnostics. It, it's still in debate, but for, for, um, for the therapies, we're definitely trying to subsidize everything. Um, but um, it's still going to have to go through a vet because... As you said, it's it's highly uh, difficult to figure out if the owner had time on whatever evening, whenever the drugs had to be administered. So you need to ver get a very reliable measurement of that. And I'm not saying the vets are definitely more reliable than pet owners, because a lot of pet owners are very reliable, and there are some unreliable vets out there. But it's just a, a, a an average rate that we are trying to improve there, um, and that's why we're gonna have to go with vets. So if you want to collaborate with us in the in the therapy trials, which I think are going to start in a few months from now, they're not going to start now on the fifth or on the fifteenth of April. Um, and if, if if you want to participate in that in a few months, email me now or then, 
um, and, and um, we can discuss, you know, finding a, a vet in your area that, that you're I'm, to I'm curious with. if you know Kent Kamish or if you've seen our salon with Kent Kamish. I heard you mention something about uh, needing more uh, tech or something, you know, about Nanopore. And he has a uh, this console that he's been working on about Nanopore. And uh, he does some Sim or was wanting to do some similar projects on mice, you know, this could be possibly, uh, you know, maybe room for collaboration there. I'm just wondering if you're, in if you knew or were aware of him and, and his stuff at all. Um, I might have heard. Um, I think, is, is it a devil box or, or something? Demon poor. <laughs> Uh, yeah, even for 64. Oh, okay. yeah. I think they've yeah, changed the game about. since then, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've I've heard of these guys. Um, they're on most longevity groups that I'm in. Um, the, I also I think John Marlowe, um, who was who uh, put me in contact with Kennedy. Um, John is also uh, working on a startup that's extending nanopore technology by automatizing specific steps. Um, and the pipelines required for the nanopores. We're going to work with him in the future as long as he, he and his brother has um, available time. Um, yeah, we're, we're up to getting in contact with anybody. So if, if you know them and you feel like um, they they have enough time, because obviously people that run companies can be very busy well, and without taking equity in hours, they may or may not be interested. But if, if you think that they can help us, Definitely put us in contact with them. And, well, I think and that I these guys could them. help possibly help each other. Is you know what I'm yeah. thinking. Not only just like him help you, but I mean he's almost kind of doing the same thing in a way with, but on a smaller scale. And if you just do that same thing on for cats, uh, I'm you know, there's a lot of times it's a win-win situation. It's possible, <laughs> you know, and. For those who have not watched it yet, I've linked to our Virtual Enlightenment Salon with Kent Kimish, which we held on June 6th, 2021. Quite an extensive conversation, two hours and 48 minutes, so please check it out if you have not done so. We have some interesting feedback from our audience as well with regard to the diagnostic pet collars. Uh, Alan Crowley writes, collars would be like a Fitbit for the cats. And Daniel Twett says uh, he could see pet Fitbits becoming a hot seller. So maybe people would be interested in purchasing diagnostic uh, measuring devices for their cats. Now, we also had an interesting comment from Mike Lazine, who observes that domestic cats live far longer than jungle cats or cats like lions. And he wonders what causes that, especially because... Lions are bigger and most jungle cats are bigger as well. And generally size positively correlates with longevity. So why do these relatively small house cats live longer? Is it just that they are in more favorable circumstances where they don't have to deal with very hostile environments at times? Or is there more to it than that? I think it, you, you summarize it, um, summarize what I'm going to say very well in the last last couple of words. So I think it's a lot in the stress side. Obviously, cats don't have to hunt buffaloes. And, um, well, buffaloes, not buffaloes. They're making stuff up now. <laughs> but um, it's, it's, um, it's a bit on the stress side. So it's, it's an observed fact that um, animals that don't have natural predators tend to live longer. Um, because they don't have to reproduce as fast. They can, um, th there's this um, germline soma, uh, disposable soma theory of aging, um, or essentially, um, which is still discussed. It's uh, evolutionary biologists disagree on it still, but the, the, the essential gist of it is that if you're not under evol evolutionary pressure from predators and so on and so forth, then you don't have to reproduce faster at younger ages and so to, for the species to survive. And so what happens is you expend more, more energy, um, more uh, meta metabolic effort um, into properly structuring your soma. 
Um, and I don't know if that's um, that's true or not. I'm just I'm just giving a very uneducated opinion on this. But I think it's mostly stress, and I think it's also access to healthcare. So um, wild animals will very often eat infected meat. Um, uh, it will eat very, um, you know, unhealthy things just to survive. Whereas cats don't have to do that. Um, and, you know, they have access to, um, there's, there, there's actually a lot of debate here as well, because people are saying sometimes on, on, um, in, in, in research papers that maybe cats are better um, better off if they eat raw meat or or um, infected um, whatever um, but or whether uh, it's just the dry grains that are bad for their health or not but right now um, even even if um, say it's healthy to eat some raw infected meat from some dying animal or something like that for um for a cat say just by random the inf the infection goes mainstream goes in their blood they get uh, sepsis um they are gonna die and there's no there, there's really very few <laughs> lion doctors out there which is what keeps their lifespan low and again trauma in in household cats is way lower than trauma in any wild wild animal um, and so remember from that paper, a lot of deaths um, in, in stray cats and in, 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 in cats in general that get to a veterinary doctor are trauma related, not age, age related diseases. So like 12.2% um, is trauma, 12.1% is um, CKD and other, um, and then downstream from there, um, less and less other age related diseases. So cumulatively aging is definitely a huge cause in cats. And the reason for that is they have access to antibiotics. They don't have to hunt um, for a living. And also they don't have poachers, I, I think, at least not in my neighborhood. And um, yeah, that's about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And indeed you articulated some of the reasons why I am a strong advocate of keeping cats indoors, and my two cats are purely indoor cats, so they do not get exposed to the trauma that they might encounter if they were to hunt outside. Uh, besides, I live in an area where there are some predators such as coyotes or hawks that I see on quite a frequent basis, and cats, uh, let's say, do not have high chances uh, when they encounter those kinds of predators. And I cannot imagine that eating infected raw meat would be a net positive for longevity. Uh, I am generally in favor of the hypothesis that foods that are designed specifically with the health of an animal in mind would at least on average, be uh, more likely to contribute to their longevity or uh, prevent their premature death than uh, just whatever random piece of meat they might find in the wild. Now, we have a question from Jose Cordero who wonders, are rapamycin treatments on your agenda for cat longevity trials? Yes, they are. I think rapamycin is one of the high effect size drugs out there. I mean, high effect as it goes, right? Like nothing is high effect enough, um, really, because um, it doesn't provide. You know, I think we all, all of us, agree that rapamycin is not a, a universal panacea that um, that really solves aging at all. But it's it's a high effect size drug, um, and it's reproducible. Um, as far as meta analyses and and and, and um, research papers go, and yeah, there it's it's on the radar. The question is not just um, whether we select individual drugs, like say, oh, we pick this one and we say this is my favorite drug, this is my favorite pathway. The really interesting question for uh, cat therapy uh, cat therapies that we're gonna we're pitching investors right now is what combination of them works best, and um, you might have seen some of these uh, approaches 
uh, across the last one or two years or three years. You might have seen uh, Steve Horvath uh, Labs. Um, at, at, it wasn't just Horvath Lab. Um, I think a recombinant growth hormone plus metformin uh, that reversed um, aging clocks by two years or so. Um, you might have seen an in, in, uh, increased um, thymic volume, right? And uh, th the thymus is a big uh, problem with aging. Uh, there's actually a lot of people at the Institute I, I work in in Oxford. Right now in Oxford, I don't work um, uh, in this moment in my PhD on age-related um, diseases, but a lot of people are working on thymic involution there at the Kennedy Institute of Rheumatology. Um, and you might have seen... Um, George Church's uh, Rejuvenate Bio um, uh, gene therapy, which targets um, Clotho and two other genes, I believe. And so you see companies pursuing um, combos of, um, of, of aging targets. But the thing that we're really interested in is scaling this up a lot. So we want to, um, to take a lot of treatment groups in a lot of control groups and compare um, real permutations of drugs that we suspect from previous computational analyses that they act in different pathways. So if you take a database like Drug Age made by the Joao Pedro um, uh, Magahes, I, th I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, from Liverpool, he's a very um, top um, biogerontology, bioinformatics uh, researcher. That database has about 2,000, um, um, or, or, no, sorry, 1,095 drugs um, that modify um, lifespan in various papers. And it's about 2,000 papers. Um, and if you take all of those 1,000 drugs approximately, and you try to run them through a pathway analysis, um, gene ontology, disease ontology, so on, these sort of um, computational um, uh, guesses at how at how the um, drugs um, manage to have an effect, um, you will see that a lot of them act through the same pathways. But the question we're trying to answer, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people are trying to answer as well, um, is whether, um, or should at least, um, answer is whether they act in, what's the best list of drugs that act in different pathways. And so the, then you have two filters. You have the filter that they have a high effect size, and then you have the filter that they have different pathways that they act in. And then there are other IND, you know, patent enabling um, uh, filters that you can apply to sort of uh, uh, get to a list of say six drugs. That you want to trial, and then from at least in our design, which we're going to carry in a few months from now, as soon as the aging clock uh, part of our project is finished, um, you want to look at combinations of two and three out of those six, right? And if you have combinations of two out of six and combinations of three out of six, all of the possible combinations, all of the possible permutations, um, you have about thirty-five treatment groups. And that's huge, right? Like, if you think, if you think about the cl classical trial, if you have one drug that you're trying to find the effect of, you usually have 1,000 subjects in the treatment group and 1,000 subjects in the control arm. And if you think about 35,000 cats that you have to trial, that's a huge budget that probably nobody's going to give us. But the really nice thing about this is most of these drugs have passed phase one trials, which means they're safe enough to use at specific doses um, in the animals that they've been trialed on. So we are only filtering for ones that are trialed in um, at least one species of felines. Um, and so the next question is, okay, well, what do you do about, uh, okay, maybe you don't have to do as much safety trialing on those 35,000 cats, right? Well, how do you lower the sample size? Because that's a really, or, or decrease the budget per cat. And then our answer to that is that statistics is really um, about finding the ac adequate sample size to demonstrate an, uh, an effect of a specific size. So if you have a very modest effect, 
like three, five percent life extension. If you want to measure something that's so small and that some large error could mess up your understanding of whether that experiment was real or not, was not real or not, well interpreted or not, um, then you have to have a very high sample size. You have to have thousands and thousands and dozens of thousands of people against thousands of people. Um, whereas if you're trying to measure a very high effect size, for example, if you're trying to measure whether men are on average taller than women, which is a very high effect size in the population, you don't need the sample size of hundreds of thousands of people to confirm the effect. You can actually confirm that effect just by watching people as you cross the street for like two minutes. So you just, just a couple dozen people, if you look at them, you will observe the effect. You will observe that on average men are taller than women by, I don't know, like 10 um, centimeters or whatever. Um, and that's the same case for us as well. We want to run 35 treatment groups, but we don't have to have a thousand cats in each one of them to be re uh, to be sure that the effect is real because we're not looking for low effect sizes. If there's some low effect size, like 7% between some whatever, 7% lifetime extension between whatever drug combo, we don't care about it. We don't need to notice that effect. If we see an insignificant P value on some reduction there, we don't care to look further into it because we know for sure that it's not going to be a high effect size. Whereas for uh, for evaluating a high effect size, really from our power calculations, you really only need about 50 cats per treatment group. As long as provided you look for high effect sizes, that's the, that's the target of the trial, which it is. And so if you multiply 35 by 50 cats, you get like 1750, um, 1,750 cats which is a moderate trial of moderate size and really fundable and really something that for whatever reason, nobody has done so far. Um, so people have done combinations of drugs, but they haven't done true random permutations of the drugs to really test the hypothesis that they act in different pathways and, and find the best combination. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for that answer. And just to follow up on an earlier comment that you made, uh, Ben Balweg kindly provided us with a link to this page on the African buffalo. So it is conceivable that some lions in Africa would hunt these particular kinds of buffalo. Now, I'm wondering, Jose, do you have any follow-up questions or comments for Alexandru? Um, thank you very much, Alexandru. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing the results. So what is the time frame of what you expect to achieve? Um, we are talking about uh, two years, five years. How long, please? Way shorter than that. We um, at least on uh, at least on the initial um, on plans, we uh, initial roadmap we have. We want to finish the um, um, aging clock study in the next three, four months or so. Um, and right after we want to start um, the trials, conditional on getting a funding. And that's what I'm struggling with in the past few weeks. I've been trying to reach a lot of people, a lot of investors to sort of get funding for this that we can start as soon as possible. The nice thing about the study is that um, it's based on uh, biomarkers. So we're going to try to find combinations of drugs that um, improves sarcopenia in elderly cats. And we're also going to measure their aging clocks so that we can see, is this also um, a nice therapy for aging in general? Maybe or maybe not. Um, and so because we're only using um, immediately measurable things like aging clocks and sarcopenia CT sort of measurements, um, and it, you know, like MRI and, and whatever other things, um, the vets we're currently discussing it with, um, are suggesting, um, I think the time scale is, um, that we're going to get recruitment starting in September, um, or October and the trial gets started somewhere around November. Um, and hopefully we're going to have most, if not all of the data by January, 2023. 
Um, so we're, we're, we aim to move as fast as possible, mainly because I'm not interested just in cats. So I want, because this thing isn't happening in humans uh, right now, my interest is in uh, doing a proof of concept and growing a company in the pet healthcare side, and then convincing bigger investors to give us all of the funding we need to go in the human arena. Because in the human side, you really need a, an army of lawyers to start anything. Um, and you need a lot of funding and proofs of concepts to sort of get it started. So we aim to do it as quickly as possible in animals um, so we can move it in as quickly as possible in, in humans. So my best guess right now is that we're going to finish by January 2023, provided that we get funding in the next couple of months. Um, and the funding is really little. Like if you think about um, um, Celine Haliowa's Loyal has about $50 million in funding. Uh, to do these sort of, the, the, not these sort of trials, but longevity trials in dogs. Um, and as far as I know from their team and, and people that work there, they're looking to uh, develop um, aging clocks and also uh, like better fine tune them to dogs and um, to um, find single molecule drugs that affect that clock, as far as I know. Um, but and Rejuvenate Bio also has a few um, dozen million dollars. The trial we we're talking about for January 2023 is really inexpensive. It costs, in our projections, around uh, $300,000. And the main reason why we are going to move that fast is the fact that we don't need to employ people to do the study. We can act through um, centralized res research organizations, CROs, that you can pay to uh, provide reagents and specific experiments that you need for um, for your trial. So you're only the planner of the trial, but you're not carrying it yourself. You're not employing people to do that. Um, and that's one strategy that I've learned from um, a good friend of mine from Oxford, uh, Sebastian Aguiar, um, Brun Meyer. And um, the second reason why we can move very fast is because there's a hunger for <laughs> innovation in the space and because there's less regulation on it. So um, while most human things, you know, you, you think about 2030 or something like that for, for cats, I think at least the initial trials at the first few centers are definitely going to be done this year, provided funding. And Didier Crenel is interested in a clarification. What kinds of results uh, are you expecting as soon as January 2023? Would these be epigenetic results, for instance? So we're expecting to have all of the before and after uh, clocks measured on um, 35 treatment groups um, for about almost 2,000 cats. Um, for combinations of known um, aging drugs. So right now the drug list isn't decided. Again, if you have advice on how how to best design this trial, we're not um, we're not um, inflexible people. So email me, um, email my co-founder, um, and um, email any of us and uh, come with advice about what what um, what drugs we we best choose. Um, in the final list, but we're mainly going by bioinformatic approaches and biochemical approaches to sort of filter down the list um, into what final six or seven drugs we're going to pick. And then what that list has to be is drugs that we sus highly suspect act in different pathways. And if they do act in different pathways, then any combination of three of them should improve lifespan by a lot, provided that the pathways aren't antagonistic. Um, so by 2023, what we hope is that one of the 35 treatment groups is going to have a very high effect size on the lifespan clock that is significant even after multiple comparisons correction, um, and that we can sort of recommend for a larger trial to say, okay, this let's confirm that this is actually happening. We have this combination of drugs that gives significantly more lifespan extension than just any individual drug. So say you get three of them. If you get 
forty percent uh, lifespan extension in cats. That's really great. That's a product that um, that would definitely hit the market. Um, if you get more than fifty percent, I'm really afraid to say that because I I don't want to spoil it. But if you get anything than that, then it would be a premiere in aging overall. Um, and and I I really hope that that would happen, even though I don't want to I don't want to promise it um, because. Really, it's not in my control. It's really biology. Um, and if it does, then I hope to get connected with investors like um, Laura Deming, I look up to, um, like um, 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 uh, 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 Thiel Cap, um, sort of level, high level investors that can really fund this. Um, because um, in the human side, it's really capital intensive. You cannot do much without dozens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Whereas in cats, there, you, you, I think it, it, it'd be really nice for um, for people to see uh, Sebastian Aguiar's um, recent talks about um, uh, longevity, uh, longevity biotechnology venture capital. And one of the things he says in those presentations, he works as a venture fellow for Apollo Health and, and a bunch of other uh, venture capitalists. Um, companies um essentially he, he says that startups have a way higher efficiency per dollar uh spent in terms of drugs approved and so f a large pharma will usually get one drug approved for a billion dollars for three billion dollars depending on um, on the way you're modeling the data of expenditures in startups you can get on average, um, a drug approved for just $80 million. So what happens a lot these days is that a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, big pharma companies are just buying the best startups. And so, um, yeah, this is, um, this is really the landscape right now. And I think we have an edge as a startup that we, we can move quickly and we can uh, do stuff with very little um, funding. Um, and hopefully inv convince investors in moving into this, this sort of stuff into humans. Of course, in the long term, uh, if you do succeed, and I hope you do succeed on the time frame that you discussed and spectacularly so, one of the uh, big risks of a big pharma acquisition that many of us in the longevity community have become quite cognizant of recently is that big pharma tends to be a lot more conservative, not politically conservative, but cautious in terms of their objectives and might not want revolutionary change in the healthcare field. So if a startup might be more ambitious and seek a radical life extension for cats, if not for humans, though some do seek radical life extension for humans, Big Pharma will look at the quarterly bottom line and say, well, how can we maximize our short-term earnings and not really look at time horizons much longer than five years if we're even lucky enough for a big pharma company to have that kind of time horizon? So how would a startup in terms of its strategy for growth and revenue avoid essentially falling into the trap of capitulating to that conservative big pharma mindset? So I think the main reason why um, why they're able to, um, I don't know how to go forward, but I, I can say what, what things are already in place in terms of um, the developments um, is the fact that most of the people that start startups um, in the pharmaceutical um, space, started because they care about um, uh, that approach, or because they know it's very effective, even if they don't care about it. Um, whereas in the pharma space, you have all of the incentives and lack of the incentives of any corporation, really. And I'm very young. I'm not um, born um, into a billionaire family, so I don't know much about. Um, corporations really at that level. But from what I can tell from writings, from um, books on this topic, because I'm very passionate about um, pharma and uh, venture capital and biotech space, I think the only thing that can sort of keep 
um, startups from um, from doing stuff for the short term is um, you know their um, their um, team's motivation and and the fact that they care about um, they care about the product or um, effects or e efficiency of of their approach. Um, I might have to leave for just 30 seconds, but I'll be right back. All right, that is fine. And while uh, Alexandru is away for a moment, I would like to highlight a few comments that were made. Mike Lazine agrees with my statements. He writes, Big Pharma cares more about putting Band-Aids on ailments and similar kinds of approaches than cures for anything. And Jason Mallory writes that Kaiser Hospitals uh, is actively avoiding AI diagnostic tools. And this is an example of a conflict he perceives between the desire for short-term profits and medical progress. But thank you, Alexandru, for your answer to that question and certainly the motivations of individual startup founders and team members are crucial in avoiding uh, capitulation to that mindset. Of course, do be careful about how you structure your agreements with investors, venture capitalists, and so forth. Try to set up those agreements so that you as the founder cannot be ousted. This is especially a risk if the startup becomes spectacularly successful. And we have seen far too many founders lose their uh, positions precisely because they did originate a breakthrough concept that somebody else wanted to appropriate. Now, I understand, Alexandru, that uh, your time is a bit limited right now. I want to get Art Ramon and Ben Balweg the opportunity to ask some questions or make some comments. So let's start with Art Ramon. Uh, yes. Do you anticipate any problems with uh, animal rights groups like PETA, you know, trying to argue that, uh, you know, cats are sentient beings and they're not consenting to becoming, you know, chemically modified organisms. And do you anticipate any problems with these cats getting loose and becoming feral and becoming, you know, just a grave uh, damaging invasive species uh, to native bird populations? And if PETA doesn't convince anyone to, you know, uh, you know, recognize cats as sentient beings, wouldn't it make sense to sterilize the longevity cats so they don't become a problem as a invasive species? I think to the last part of your question, um, I think that's that's a, a really it's really hard to figure out how much of that is because because really this is a U.S. transhumanist party discussion. Maybe we can bring a bit of politics into this. I think it's it's. It's really interesting to think about how much of that is a negative externality that has to be mitigated by some centralized authority or how much of it is something that has to be managed at the local level or how much of that is just freedoms of individuals that you can't um, can insurmount with, with just power, um, governmental power. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a really hard debate and it's very political and, and, and it's really, um, a thing where I'd like to uh, get my popcorn and watch a bunch of minarchists and and libertarians fight socialists and communists and centrists fighting both of them. And I, I would love to see that fight. Um, I would probably even pay money to see it. Um, but I wouldn't give an answer um, because my own opinion fluctuates as uh, most people's. Um, and also I don't like, I don't want to fix it in time and say, oh, someone can point to this and say, oh, Alex is this on the spectrum. Um, and also, um, I, I, I think it's a serious debate and I, I can't really participate seriously in it because I'm not a scholar of politics, even though I'm very interested in it. Um, and Really, in terms of in, in terms of castrating cats, whether they're uh, humans or not, actually, I think most humans don't care if cats are people or not, whether they have rights or not. They just don't want you. They they just don't want people in general to be, you know, like mistreating them. Um, 
physically, right? Like beating a cat, something like that's unacceptable to most people and probably rightfully so. Um, but um, then in terms of castration, that's definitely um, something that's highly debated, whether it's voluntary or not. Um, I think it's an interesting way of thinking about um, driving the dynamics of predators and in, in, in negative externalities like um, like um, ecology. And cats are definitely a big threat to um, to birds in general um, and to um, diversity, eco-diversity in general, since birds drive some of the um, other ecological dynamics in, in the area. Um, but um, how that should be managed, I have no idea, um, really. Or at least I don't want to pinpoint it. Um, on the other hand side, talking about PETA specifically, um, again, I don't want to pinpoint uh, an opinion on PETA, but I just want to make it obvious to everyone that's watching this that um, obviously, as all organizations, PETA is doing both good and bad things, right? Like you, you can single out Bernie for saying uh, something about Castro. Oh, oh, Castro did something good, right? Or, or something like that. And it's like, if Castro is telling you, you know, breathing is good, you should breathe. Then obviously you don't want to go all like, oh, Kami's uh, told me uh, breathing is good. Maybe I shouldn't breathe or something like that, right? So like all organizations, PETA is doing some things that are good, right? Like they're fighting some, um, and not some, like some significant, um, injustice is done to human uh, to animals, um, but at the same time, as I, I guess from your tone, you've observed that they do some pretty nasty stuff to people that are actually not against animals' rights. Um, and I sort of agree there. I've seen some violent things happening related to PETA, and I don't I don't know if that's individual actors or the organization itself. And again, I don't want to you know like pinpoint myself. Oh. Alex agrees with PETA or it doesn't agree with PETA or, or stuff like that. But essentially, um, I think they are a problem, especially if you're doing something bad. Like if you're doing something that's not bad to cats, um, they're probably a problem or some individ rogue individuals inside them or maybe the actual organization, they're going to be a problem or not. But if you do something bad, it's definitely going to be a problem. So there's been uh, news recently about um, uh, federal funding for whatever experiments where cats were killed at the end of the experiment. The reason why they were killed is they weren't pets that were owned by um, or, or that were in terminal diseases or anything like that, but they didn't have owners. They were specifically bred just for research. And that's what happens to a lot of mice and people don't even know. Most of the mice at the end of experiments, unless they're on a survival curve um, experiment, they're killed. Um, and especially if they're like a control that outlived whatever treatment, um, those ones are going to get killed at the end of the day because it's cheaper that way. And um, people care about the economics of um, animal trials. Well, people, the, the people that ran the, those sort of studies. For us, I'm sure it's not going to be a problem. So even if there are rogue people or PETA itself, it, it takes an issue with the sort of research that we're going to do. I'm sure it's not going to be a problem, mainly because we're not doing research on cats to make research on humans better. We really want the drug to be approved for um, cat uses. Uh, so we really want to mitigate cat sarcopenia. We want to mitigate um, uh, chronic kidney disease if we, if we are successful with um, sarcopenia. Um, we want to go into a few diseases and sort of try to get new therapeutic approaches for them for cats. We're not trying, it's not the classical, I'm trying this in mice so I can do it in humans sort of thing. We really want this to work for cats first. And secondly, and, and we don't expect that the cocktails are going to work best for cats or are going to work best in humans. We're just hoping that the design, tri the, the trial design is going to work um, nicely in humans. And then the second thing is, we're not going to kill cats. I am 100% sure that we're going to manage the uh, drug doses such that they're um, known to be safe from previous trials. So we're, we're not going to do anything harmful to cats at all. If anything, we might prolong their lifespans and health spans. So it's, we, we, we're not 
we're not pushing aggressively some new experimental uh, drug. We are careful about um, the dosages of combinations, and we're doing a lot of uh, mitigation in there. Um, and what once it starts, and um, our plans are completely non-harmful and are not for selfish reasons. Well, some selfish reasons, but not that's not the main driver of it, right? Um, so, so how so quickly would the benefits of the drugs uh, wear off if it were to escape and become feral? We don't know. We we have to we have to see that in the data, and we are going to evaluate that. How we are also trying to figure out how we can translate from age clock reversals to actual lifespan um, increases. We're we're going to do a lot of statistical analyses. Um, and, and nice modeling of data once we, we can um, uh, fund the whole of the um, goals that we have to, for the company. So right now we have 10K in funding from Gitcoin for roughly 10K for, um, well, we are getting it on the 15th of April for the, 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 the first agent clock for cats. They're fine-tuned for cost and, and as high accuracy and improved signal from other methods than just blood clocks. Um, and then we need about, uh, 300K worth, depending on a model uh, for the trials and, um, for all the other evaluations, obviously you just raise more money or you use the revenue that you get from the licensing of the first things that worked. Um, and so depending on what we were going to try to evaluate. And one of the things that we were going to try to evaluate is how fast it wears off, um, um, I think that's uh, how fast it wears off is definitely not going to be a part of the data that we're trying to generate by January, 2023. So it's going to be a later, uh, time point in terms of that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that answer. And this is a fascinating discussion. Didier Cornell writes that the very strange thing is that even for studies concerning longevity, in most cases, mice are killed before they die, quote, of old age. And the reason that is sometimes given is to better be able to examine the animals. But really, when we are investigating the impacts of particular treatments or regimens on longevity, the best practice, in my view, should be to let the mice live for as long as possible, because uh, one might be surprised, including uh, from the control group as well as to how long these mice can live. But I don't think anybody would be able to beat Andre Bartke's uh, longevity record for his uh, genetically engineered dwarf mice that almost lived to five years, unless uh, they were to let the mice survive for as long as they would survive after the official completion of the experiment. Now, I want to give Ben Balweg the opportunity to ask his question as well. Uh, I want to clarify, I guess I thought before today that we were going to be talking about why you were developing a test for cat diagnostics. And it seems like the goal is more to test uh, multi-treatment therapy for cats. Uh, so if that's the goal, uh, can you go into why you need to develop your own cat longevity clock? Uh, is it a cost issue versus Horvath's or Tell me more there. There's multiple things there. So I'm, I'm going to start with the last part of the question because that's that's a really interesting one. So uh, most of the clocks are, are actually very expensive. Um, uh, the, the, I'm not. I, I try not to uh, cite specific uh, um, quotes that were given to us just because they're personalized to each um, provider and requester and so on. But um, most of them are above a hundred dollars a clock. So if you have to clock something twice, some some uh, some cat twice, you get a, a, above two hundred dollars per cat in terms of just just the uh, just the primary endpoint, right? So or the secondary endpoint, wh whichever way you design the study, um, which is already more than most therapies. So just the readout of whether your therapy worked is more expensive than your therapy, which is very um, it's not, it's ill-advised, I think. Um, and obviously it's, it's, it's ill-advised in the context of where you can improve that. Obviously, if you can improve that, that's fine. It's still cheaper than a survival trial. Um, so a survival trial will probably cost in the thousands of dollars, depending on how you design it. Um, and 
the the reason why we're trying to um, do this uh, cheaper longevity clock is because we want an open source clock that's cheap as possible and accurate as possible, as accurate as possible. And there are very few ones like that. It, it, actually, none of that, except a very recent one that came, I think, a few months back uh, called TimeSeek. And it's made by, um, in collaboration with David Sinclair's lab, I think. And the idea there was essentially that you could get the same or at least almost almost the same signal just by uh, reading less um, DNA methylation molecules. So they're doing low depth um, bisulfate sequencing essentially. And they're using a bunch of advances that have been um, made at that point with dealing with sparse data. Um, that was mostly because of single cell measurements um, that were improved back then. Um, and I work with single cell um, sequencing technology at the institute um, I'm at right now that I'm graduating with from in a few months um, at the University of Oxford. And um, th that definitely sparked my imagination as to how low the costs can go. So the cost from the time seek technology can go to about $10 a sample. Which is amazing, right? And it keeps a, a fair proportion of the accuracy of other clocks out there. Now, there's definitely disagreements on among statisticians and among people that design aging clocks whether that's appropriate. I'm not sure if uh, Pro uh, Professor Morgan Levine, which I the work of which I admire, if Professor Stephen Horvath agree with that sort of strategy. I sort of think it's interesting. And I think it's we ought to pursue it. Um, and I think we also ought to pursue things that are um, outside of omixy blood readings um, to sort of improve the signal on that, such as um, MRI imaging and, and so on and so forth. And so that's why we're trying to design this new clock. And also because we're fine tuning it to cat data, which is, um, you know, if for people uh, familiar with deep learning, uh, similar to like a transfer learning process. Um, and you, and you want to um, do that to the best of your abilities, which people haven't done in CATS yet. Um, and what we're doing is we're trying to uh, improve or change some um, methods from the time seek uh, technology um, and, and bring in a bit of our own ideas and te um, technologies we had in mind. Um, and also, um, we are very interested in using it for, um, as, as you said, combinatorial uh, drug trials, mainly because even though the primary endpoint of those combinatory um, uh, drug trials is going to be something very simple and classical, like um, a clinician's evaluation of the degree of sarcopenia in a cat, um, which is usually done with um, imaging of the muscles or um, a BMI combined with some uh, body fat percentage measurement or, or something like, like that. Um, you, um, we, we actually also want to see if the drug trial, that uh, the drug combo that succeeded in sarcopenia, um, which is obviously an age-related illness, um, also lowers the overall aging clock that's similar to TimeSeq and similar to older aging clocks like Steve Horvath, the Levine clock, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're trying to, um, I don't know how this translates from Romanian to English. I think hit two bunnies with a stone. It's very primitive, um, but, <laughs> and very <laughs> raw. And now definitely PETA is going to go after me, but, um, so in it, the Western world, they hid birds <laughs> and then Romania, they hit rabbits. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I, I think I don't know. It's uh, maybe, maybe maybe I'm making stuff up right now, but yeah. Do you put crossing with Peter? Yeah, I'm probably that. Um, I don't even I don't even know if that's that's maybe yeah. <laughs> but um, essentially, that's the reason why we we do the clocks so that we can a um, improve things that are already used by for for other purposes, not just combinatorial drug purposes, um, uh, drug trials but also for the combinatorial drug trials so that we can um, see whether it's a, it, 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 it could perfectly be the case. They have a combination of drugs 
that works very well against sarcopenia, but doesn't really prolong lifespan. So that's why, as opposed to only having a primary endpoint where we're looking at the muscle mass of the cat, we also try to have a very good measurement of longevity that's not as expensive and long, um, long taking as um, survival studies, but mm -hmm. um, but efficient and accurate and uh, affordable. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alexandru, for your uh, time today and for the insights that you've shared. Uh, now, this is a fascinating conversation, and hopefully we can continue it in the future, especially as your research gets further along. But now our time for our virtual enlightenment salon has come to an end. So thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you to our panel and our audience. And until next time, every Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time, 4 p.m. Eastern time, live long and prosper. Live